Hello, chess friends. This is International Master Valery Lewov, and welcome to today's lecture on YouTube. I'd like to welcome you all for uh, a very interesting topic that I haven't actually discussed in a while. And this is uh, uh, the topic of attacking, and more importantly, sacrifices. Now, uh, a lot of chess players do realize the importance of being good at sacrifices. In fact, it's, that's quite a, quite a huge thing. It is that they're not quite well aware of how to do it right. And so this is where, you know, in, mu in much of the time, and most of the times, um, you know, people tend to kind of feel a little confused, not understanding really all that well. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about sacrifice. I'm going to talk to you about how the grain masters do it. So that, you know, once you really know, once you're aware of this, it can help you not just to execute this and follow up some of their techniques, but also really get to do this yourself in any matches, tournament or online. So let's get started. First of all, we're going to begin with uh, a brilliant game that was actually played by Floor versus Larsen, two of the greatest classical chess players, you know, in the in the past. I, I think that they were, you know, learning the classics is always more important. It's just that most people don't want to do it because they don't know the themes of the game, so it feels very confusing. So today's theme is clear. It's going to be about sacrifice. We're going to see how two great players approach it from the both sides, from the both angles of, of, of the game. So hold on for a second. Here is the game. I'm going to copy it now. That was basically annotated by Grandmaster Brian Smith in his uh, very recent uh, like course, uh, his method, basically, which you could uh, which you could actually uh, check for a 50% discount on the link below this video. It's an amazing course. He presents a lot of classical examples. So... Uh, Grandmaster Solofloor was actually playing White versus Ben Larson, and the game started with the Benoni. Black played e6, knight c3, d6, and then there was e4. So we have the King Symbian. I mean, a pretty straightforward approach. And uh, so um, after that move of pawn up to the g6, then <clears throat> this is quite interesting. Then White played with uh, bishop to the d3, bishop g7, and knight e2. So, um, so you can see White's definitely getting ready. He's, uh, you know, moving out his pieces, just setting them up. And um, this is pretty important. So ultimately, Black does knight be set. Now remember, every great master of the attack starts it with simple moves. You see, this is what we'd like to do. So what we do is we start simple moves that can help us to actually set up our pieces in line with everything else. So we got we get that knight of the d7, h3, and a6. It's very interesting because the first thing that you realize is that we're actually taking away the ability for our opponent to advance with something like knight of the b5. And that's really great. Very interesting. The most important thing actually is that we could find out also not just the way to attack against the opponent, but maybe we could play a rook to the d8, rook to rook to b8, and uh, you know b5. So that's a that's very very important. Little by little, as I've always said, structure is everything. So we start it. Now next move, white played with bishop e3, and black plays knight h5. Now remember, this is done for one particular goal in mind. All the black wants to do is just make sure that his pieces are close enough to advance on the king's side. Whether it's going to be with his short castles, f5, knight f4, or even b5, it doesn't matter so much. The idea is that things are going to work out on that side of the board. And uh, so that's perfect. So like basically white plays queen to the d2 in this type of position. And um, so let's say what is going on next? <clears throat> Queen b2, short castles, g4. See, White thought, okay, you know what? This knight is not that much of a, a like a, a nice piece. I can't let it be there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to force it away. Makes a great sense. 
pushes the knight back. And eventually what we'd like to do is like bishop to the h6. And if this goes on, it sounds like white has actually you know, stopped most of the threats. Things look good. They do. They do. Now, that doesn't mean that it's perfect, but it looks like a good start. So what do we do next after g4? Well, the moment white actually played with the move of g4, pretty much black plays with the move of... Black has to decide between two moves. Knight going back or knight going forward. Now, knight f4 is obviously going to be with an actual sacrifice, so we don't want to just, you know, immediately jump in with that without calculations. Knight f4 will sacrifice. Knight f6 will be backward on another hand. So it's really like a complex question to figure out which of those moves must be done, considering that either of them really feels like, you know, it's backward and not too perfect. So what I really want you to do is to think for a second and give me your opinion your thoughts about you know what should be the best decision given the situation given how it all looks what is the best thing that black can do to make things better i mean we could be playing a move of knight of the f6 <clears throat> or we could be playing a move of knight of the f4 in that moment uh we could be advancing in this or that other way it's a, it's a good quick question what would you choose tell me guys what would you choose so that I can tell you if you're right or if you're in the wrong? So, what is it? Yeah, basically not a four. Absolutely. You see, we don't care about the pawn right now. What we care about is are our pieces going to have the chance to advance or attack the opponent? Knight f4 may not be perfect, but what it does beautifully is that it brings all of the black necessary forces in a new light. They can jump in, they can attack, they can threaten. And so in case he exchanges and then we recapture, we're going to have that ability to advance against the, uh, you know, the opponent's c3 and maybe even the b2. And it would be terrific. Very strong, very important. So after that move, white exchange takes, takes, and then 95. That's called a positional sacrifice. In most times when you do a move like that, or if you sacrifice in such a way, you would just kind of think about uh, why do we, what do we do it? Like, what do we get? But you got to understand that sometimes we actually do this in order to get pressure. Pressure isn't an immediate type of, of initiative where immediate, it doesn't have immediate threats. But what it does is that it gives us all the open space and opportunities for, for attack. White has to move the bishop back in order to defend the f3 check. That was very necessary. But then the problem is that when he does, when he does do it, it's like uh, what we're seeing now is that black can do b5 on the open lines. And it's perfect. It's wonderful. It's tremendous. And then, uh, you know, again, pawns don't matter when it comes down to you attacking over the opponent. That's all you'd like to be thinking about. And so, for instance, after that move of uh, b5, white actually played with c6 to the b. And then there was the move of a6 to the b that gives us a, I mean, it's almost a brilliant sequence. But what it does, more importantly, is that it helps Black to feel the power now. Every piece it's now that he can he can jump in with it feels amazing. Now White played Knight X to the B5, Rook A4. Knight C3, Rook D4. The Rook and the Knight are both in incredible positions, keeping the pressure and attention against the opponent. But what's also great is that we can think about moves like Rook E8, C4, Knight D3, you name it. All these pieces and the possibilities working towards what White just feels excellent in the way. And it works. White moves Queen E3, and then we do Rook after E8. I mean, if you just pause for a second to think about what Black got, you realize how useless 
how literally, utterly useless every single one of the white pieces actually is. Think about it for a second. What did white get? Nothing. It's like those couple pawns on the A2 and B2 are so far back and completely irrelevant that they can't even move, you know, in order to, uh, I don't know, oppose or create an actual challenge. So that was a wonderful thing. And uh, so it's like it was just it was a great way to go forward. So let's see this. Why well, I played queen of the G3 right now. And now what would you guys do with black? Think about this. A lot of power, a lot of preparation. What do we do next? We've sacrificed. We've done it perfectly. But now where, where do we go next? <laughs> Very, very strong question. Anyone? Now, while you're thinking about that, once again, I do want to encourage you to take a look below uh, this video so you can check Grandmaster Brian Smith's brilliant course on uh, positional play. I think he's uh, he's made some uh, you know incredible ideas. He, you know, just you could, it's 14 hours for like a, a, like 50% with a 50% discount. You might really love it because he explains a lot about the master techniques from starting from the very beginning. I post a link on the chat, but you can find it right beneath the video window. Now, Queen A5, Black has a D4 point, uh, point forever. I think that's good, but um, Black played G5. Crazy looking move, if you ask me, but it was very, very important because if you look at this, what we care most about as black is the ability to push down white, make the queen go for the f6, and really, like all these pieces that black is having are now going to be posted on much better, a lot stronger positions, actually which is what we're looking to do. Very important and a, and a relevant idea to keep up to keep up the position and, and hold the opponent back. The secret, let me tell you this, the secret in these situations, the real secret in these situations, always comes down to one thing. Can you keep your opponent a little bit more behind like this? If the answer is yes, that's the only answer that matters. Honestly, the only thing that you would ever care about. It's just, it's its right there. And uh, it was wonderful. I mean, like, right after that move, apparently things are going great. And <coughs> uh, essentially, white plate with the move of, uh, okay, so there's bishop to the e3. And so what's happening in this moment here? And, of course, we're playing with knight to the g6 with the idea of playing the move of... Um, we can have that idea of playing knight of bishop e5, knight f4. I was given the chance to take the rook, but nobody would care. Because when you really think of it, uh, that move of bishop takes to the d4 would immediately kill in white's position, you know, white's, white's tactics. You can see this. Eventually, the whole idea is that if white jumps in to do... Uh, bishop takes to the d4. Black would have taken back with the pawn. Rook takes to the d4. And you could just see the initiative looming from every single like uh, spot of Black's own position. Now, if you look at white, I don't think we can say the same thing. You know, we could see that white has a lot more to prove that his game is going gonna, is gonna to work out. So remember that. Pressure is everything. Material is secondary in these positions. I mean, I'm not saying that it doesn't matter. I'm just saying that it doesn't matter as much. So, in the moment we actually did this, things are working out really great and really terrific. So, it's just, it's beautiful and it's efficient and it is working. So, what happened after that move of, um, actually, the I mean, when, when this happened, 
Well, I don't think you liked it. <clears throat> I can certainly say that. And so let me see here, here, Rook Knight X to the E4. Then there was this Rook takes to the E. Surely White has plenty to be concerned about. Uh, White counted on the short side. We did a good job, but now Black plays Rook B4. Now Black's material down, and yet, and yet, he is winning because it doesn't matter. Okay, you want to know that. It doesn't matter whether he is material down or not. What matters is that he's got the ability, the capability to hold White down and keep him in a very crisp, hard-to-play position with much to worry. <clears throat> bishop b3, bishop b5, queen f3, and knight h4. What does it really matter if he is having a good-looking position or good-looking pieces if they don't do much? What is the point of having a rook on a1 or a rook on f1? That's why I always say it. there are three things, three key elements that determine whether the piece is good or not. First is the activity of the piece, how advanced it is. Something amazing about each of Black's pieces is you see how far advanced and, and powerful they look. Second, you actually might see that, uh, you know, the we care about the effectiveness so what are they actually doing? Very, very important idea. What do they do? How important they, they really happen to be. So their effectiveness depending on what they do. And most important question, think about what is the coordination? How do they work together with the other pieces? So how they're working actually together with other pieces, that's what really counts. So we can see this, and the reality is that with the move of knight of the h4, <clears throat> then we have the f3, we can have f5, we can have the dark square bishop, the, the light, you know, the light square bishop, the rook is in there. It's really making him to worry a lot. He moved the queen back, then black's own queen came forward. And then you could see it. It's just amazing. Just the, the plan, the pieces, the resources. Look at this. And what about White? I don't know. What about him? He's down. He is down and he is not coming back up anytime soon. What does it matter? Once again, remember that there is this thing which we call a relative value between the pieces. And the relative value always depends on what the piece or the pieces can do. And so if you look at White, one of the biggest issues that he's having is that his pieces really or literally do nothing. I mean, they're not horrible, but if you look at the rook on a1, if you look at the rook on f1, if you look at all those like downside back pack, backpack pieces, they're, they're just awful <laughs> in every way. So this is very, very important. And we realize what the difference is going to be, and and what what would make, what would it make? So after that, uh, surely White was in trouble. <clears throat> Let's see. Actually played with a three in order to drive the opponent's uh, rook away. I think that's not that's not so bad. I mean, it's, we could look, we could uh, think about um, he's trying to threaten, and uh, so um, that's fine. But then, what do we do in this position after this? Is knight f three, king g two, and then uh, surely the idea is that uh, you know, I mean, just look at that. It's just it's it's horrible. He's got a problem. And there is definitely a lot more for him to be worried about, and uh, it's not good. So let's see. Okay, so what's going on in this type of position? <clears throat> so in this moment, like right after that happened, he then, of course, replaced Bishop Dice G4. <sighs> this is the finish line, basically, right here and now. This is it. It takes him down. And then if you look at more, a little bit more at him and his position, it's just, wow, this is a disaster. Nothing that he can do in this type of position uh, is going to help him to stay up. And uh, truth is, it's already gone. He's done. 
and uh, yeah, let's see actually, actually what does it uh, you know what does it really bring to you? I mean so in this position apparently nothing good. So um, let's see. Um, it's pretty amazing. Just I mean I want to say that because it's it is quite incredible. Like he, what is he gonna do? Right? So just he basically if he plays with eight x to the b, that's one of the things that he can try. But who cares? Just eight x to the b. Now uh, it immediately leads up to the idea of playing. Okay, so takes takes, and then we have the ability to play with the move of. Uh, uh, bishop takes to d1. We're able to effectively break him down. We've got knight f3 as a move, and uh, <clears throat> that's it. So, uh, actually, this is you can't do anything. So, that's good. Amazing idea of how you can get all the all the attack in play. Now, what, what, if, what if I take with h takes g? See how useless those rooks are? Because they can never come into the play. Masters always find, don't forget that, masters always find a way to get the pieces exactly where they are and where they need to be so that things work out. And uh, that's it. It's perfect. Very, very good idea and uh, amazing. So now what White I can do is King H3, Rook H4, though. Then, of course, the king comes back, and right upon that, we got a check. So it's a checkmate. Can't do it. So it's too, it's too dangerous. It's too impossible to do. I really love this position. And what's quite amazing, really, I mean, just starting with that, is the thing. What's the key, you know, to make things work? The key about any position, just like that, is to understand that first and foremost, the big deal, the big idea is it's not about what pieces you got. It's about pieces, what pieces you can introduce, how you could use those pieces in order to make your tactics work out. I want to show you another game right now, but just to be just to be clear, if you want to check this and other games, do not forget to look into Grandmaster uh, Brian Smith's new course. Brian Smith is one of the most active chess players and a fantastic Grandmaster, actually. You might want to check the link to his new course, Master of Sacrifice. It's uh, uh, only available for a few hours at a 50% off. So it's a great offer. It's a huge course, more than 14 hours of training, and you're going to love it. So let me show you another super cool game from his course that was played by the young grandmaster Timo Feyev versus Hismatulin, two Russian grandmasters in a fantastic game that explains a lot about how sacrifices work. While this game explains more about the um, you know, the mechanics of a sacrifice, this next game speaks in a different language. Let's talk about it. It's time from white. After the moves of e4, c5, and the Spanish, uh, sorry, the, yeah, we can call it Spanish, Sicilian, the S Moscow variation uh, came through. Basically, white got the Marazzi bind. I've always loved this opening for white, and one of the reasons probably is because it just brings so much to the table. It's um, it's good, it's solid, and uh, it can bring many different possibilities. So it's a, it's one of the good lines, one of the good openings. So let's see. After the moves of knight xd4, knight f6, and uh, f3, okay. <laughs> Basically, what happened here was that, uh, yes, so just uh, black developed his bishop out there. And <clears throat> it was actually quite good. You know, so it was, okay, let's develop the bishop. Let's get ready to castle. Pretty smart. All White did was bishop e3. And his idea was obviously to come out with a move like queen to the d2 and possibly prepare for bishop to the h6. This is good. So what are we going to do now? After the move of bishop to the e3, black played short castles. And then after the short castles, okay, then 
This was the time where White picked up to do castles here and then B3. And that's a perfect position. Not only because of the defense on C4, but also because White's ready to advance. He can do so much more as a continuation. He can do queen d2, rook d1. I've always said that one of the most important ingredients of a successful opening is the space. Because the space you control, the space you can get, is often going to determine to a huge percentage, uh, not just the opponent's attacking opportunity so you can limit him, but it's going to determine your ideas and much of the combinations that you can take. So that's a very powerful, very good idea that White came up with. Now, basically, Black played with a6, and then there was a4 in this moment. So we have the the b5 that is uh, <coughs> taken away from Black. Of course, he played queen d8. Now, I gotta tell I gotta tell you this. I'm, I don't agree with that move. This to me, this move is just awful. Let's face it, it's it's not good. It's really not. He played it because he wanted to open the flight square for d7 for the knight so that the knight can eventually go down and move a uh, move around to c5 and, and do something like this. And it, it made sense. Okay. He did. But it's, it's not perfect. It certainly is not perfect. And so just the fact that Black did it this way does not change anything. It, it's not good. Now, what, what was, what's come out in this case is very, very instructive. I want to I wanna bring it up and show you. What really has happened it was the following. After Black just came back like this, say with the queen, White played with queen to the d2 on his own. Made a great sense here because it's not just about like getting the queen, but like let him. Keep in mind this. Let your opponent make the mistakes. Okay, this is a huge idea. Don't do it. Don't push it. Let him make the mistakes that he needs to. Very important idea. And once that happened, so let's see what really went on here. Once this happened, black plays queen a5, and then white does rook d1. Here, rook c1. See, nothing's, nothing's going on differently. We just develop. Remember, circumstances are crystal needed before any tactic takes place. You can't make your tactics unless you get your pieces in the play. <coughs> See, White knew that. So he was very, very critical about just getting the necessary amount of forces in line. When this happened, Black did knight d7, h3. Knight takes d4, bishop takes d4, bishop takes d4, queen takes d4. So Black decided, you know what, I, I don't feel comfortable enough sitting in this position. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to exchange the queens. I'm going to just, uh, you know, trade off, neutralize a little bit of the attacking power. And you know what, it's going to go away. Hmm. It's an interesting position. Does it? Not really. Why well, played king f1? Queen takes d4, or rook takes to the d4. Knight c5, and now white does rook to the b1. And I want you to take a look at this position. It's not so much about the way on how most of white's pieces stand, because they stand perfectly. It's the restriction over black that really holds a huge problem, a big grudge on his position. So black may or may not have the ability to break open. But what is so certain, I think, about this position is the fact that White is dominating at the moment. He's dominating the position, and we're going to keep Black down for longer. That's great. A5. So let's talk about a plan here, because this is an excellent position. I mean, what kind of a sacrifice are we going to talk about, really, here? You will say. You will see. We're going to talk about that. But let's talk about what White should do. Does anybody have a suggestion on how White can really improve his position and come up with a good plan? So what do we do now? 
Anyone? Please let me know. You know, on the chat, you could just send me your suggestion. Let's see. What should I do? In a Marozzi, does the pawn on the C4 become a target? Not really. Unless you actually defend it, with, you know, don't defend it, or you let the opponent to go ahead with a move like B5, it's not that much of a problem. Now, again, we go with that same question. What is White's correct plan? Knight D5, not bad. Not bad. Although White just wanted to improve the bad pieces first. You see, this knight, this knight can always jump on d5. It's not a bad move. But what White wanted to do so much more, like he felt he should do so much more, was to take the chance and really make sure that these pieces can, can ultimately get themselves through and, and move along. With the king going up, we have the ability to move up forward to the e3. There could be a move of knight of the d5, which we can do. And there also could be a move like an attack against the e7 and other moves. <clears throat> so you realize that, uh, you know, in this particular moment, it's not just the fact that white is standing well, but, uh, you know, we're ready. So let's take a look. f6, king b2, king c2. So the king is, he wasn't doing anything either. So we're going to use that. To tie to untie our rook, and once we actually get our rook into the play, that's going to just give us so much more power, power, and possibilities. See, that's a it's a big it's a big deal now. <coughs> Sorry. Start with the question. It's a big question. Let's start with that. What do I need to do? Okay, so you look at that and you say, "Okay, well, I need to get that rook right away." So. Set it up. Things are good. And there could be a lot more. But it's very, very necessary you do it this way. So what's going on next in this position? Is there more? Sure thing. Of course, there is a lot more. But it looks great for now. So h5. Black's really intending to advance. So he's just going up and really starting with some some tactical things or features against our position. It makes great sense. It does. So what is white supposed to do now? Hmm. You know, the way, I, the way I look at this position, the first thing that, that jumps out of me <clears throat> almost immediately is like, this has got to, this has got to go well. Or it's got to go better. But how? How do we do this? Because there's no breakthrough. There's no open line. There's no immediate tactic of any kind. So it's really challenging, actually, when you think of it. It's not that easy. <clears throat> now, the way to go, the way to go is to regroup. If you can't find a breakthrough or something that you can do against your opponent, it's likely because you cannot, you're not actually finding the best squares for your pieces. It's really that simple. So you don't have to do anything special. Just look around, find out what your pieces are, like the ones that, are, that you feel are were, were down or uh, back or passive, and bring them in. It's really that simple. You do not have to do anything special. Most chess players think it's about, oh, it's, I'm, I'm supposed to find out something amazing. No, you're not. No, you are not supposed to find nothing amazing. You're, what you're supposed to look for is a way to take some of those pieces that you felt were a little bit more back or away or, or, or not so good, let's say, and bring them in so that they can do their stuff, they can do their job, and do it well. See, that is how it was supposed to go. <coughs> Very interesting. You know, the truth is, after that was played, I don't think White was actually feeling all too comfortable anymore. He's got a problem. H4, rook d5, rook c6, rook e1, c8, rook f1. We kind of tease him a little bit, even. 
So you tease your opponent a little bit. Don't give him, don't let him just have everything ready and you know in the begin from the right from the start. Let him work for it. Okay, it's not gonna, it's not gonna be an easy thing for him. It's not gonna be easy for for you. So just let's let's take it. Let's let's move it forward. So what happened here? Black plays rugby six, rugby one. Remember, you're better. That means you can wait. You've got the time to wait. Your opponent, he's the one who's going to lose patience or basically lose his control. Either way, that's perfect. It's, it's what we need. We need him to lose the control. This here, and then ultimately, black plays rook g8, 93. Rook B, <clears throat> and this was a good time for White to do Knight of Five. This Rook D one. And now I'm just going quickly because you're likely going to ask me, uh, "Damn, what is White doing?" And if you, the moment you say that, you know, I'm going to tell you, "Yeah, you know, just it doesn't look like he's doing anything." But, but, give me a second. Let me tell you, what White is doing is really just taking the opportunity to build towards the position that he wants. Okay, so he's going to build towards that. He's not going to get it ready. He's going to build towards that, and he is likely going to achieve it <clears throat> as long as it keeps happening, keeps going. So let's see. This, then black plate, rook a8, rook b5. I see seven. I think I think that was just being uh, it's being long time, you know, just moving around and keeping up. And I like that. I mean, I always like the ideas in which you could just uh, arrange our pieces and keep them along. But uh, right now, we need more than that. We need more than just to be nicely advanced and and good. So strong knight, good looking, you know, like rook, and a fine pressure. But now black's actually trying to push us back. So what is White supposed to do now? <clears throat> very, very good question. And I need you to think, and I need you to tell me what is it that you think White's got to go for. <clears throat> Knight takes D6. Um, that would have worked. If it wasn't for just the capture, you know, the truth is if we take and he just captures after rook takes d6, rook takes d6, rook takes d6, he can just go king e7 or something, and, and he's all right. Not just all right, but quite good, actually, if you think of it, because he could just uh, move it, uh, you know, in the way. And uh, so this is very, very important. And so, uh, you know, be careful. Really Really careful. A sacrifice requires one of two things. Don't forget that. The first thing that it requires is initiative. I mean, that's the easiest. We know those as tactical sacrifices. If we do them, usually the idea is that we get a threat after another, after another, and like a push, jump again and again and again and again and again. That's good. But actually, we don't have always the opportunity to do it. Like, this is a, a, an end game here. So, basically, we can rely on the second thing, which is ultimately, uh, like, about uh, thinking, how do we make more pressure? Pressure is the key to that, to letting to getting the opponent. Maybe we can play rook b6 here, but then we'll play rook a7 and drive our rook. So you know why I didn't want that? Now this was what he did. Perfect. Brilliant looking move, which is with the idea to actually exercise more attack against black. And in case black played with the move of 9x to the B, there's the move of 8x to the B. <laughs> King D8, Rook A1, E6, and then there's the move of Knight of the E3. D5, exchange, Rook d6 and then c5. What's quite good is that, uh, you know, just we could have that, not just those pawns kind of moving closer, but we've got the move of rook to the pawn up to the d6 that will happen. The knight's also coming along, and we've got like three 
brilliant pawns, each of one of which is gonna you know move inside and keep the opponent back. After black moved down, we have a king d4 that also worked. Rook c8, rook takes a5. e5 check, king c4. And what's most amazing now is that white just gets to, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, white gets to protect and keep up the pieces out there. And so, you know, this is very, very, very critical. We get that to advance out there. Uh, you know, and then we can have of the B4, B to D, B to D. White has sacrificed two rooks. Who cares? Two rooks for four pawns, and yet a knight is out there as well. It is a wonderful, really huge move that kind of catches Black completely off guard, and those pawns are really threatening to move forward. If they do, there's nothing you can do. If the white pawns go ahead, the knight's going to follow. The king is going to come through. And none of black's own pieces out there in this position. And uh, so this is this is good. We get ready. We get to advance. Black plays rook a8. We can have a6 to follow. And then after that, if black plays alongside with <coughs> e4, then white continues with f takes the Five pawns are amazingly moving, you know, into Black's territory. And we also have moves like C6 and others to just, uh, uh, you know, just carry it on. It, it's, this is it. What about Black? <laughs> what about him? Nothing. You know, again, remember that value that I was say, mentioning? Like, the relative value of the pieces, depending on what the piece is doing and how useful it is? Well, guess what? That is pretty amazing here because then none of Black's own pieces are going to be going anywhere. And so um, now in this position, Black played King d7, not a 5. Rook e8, c6 check. Each of those is moving. <clears throat> the king is going to be backing them up. And then there is more things. There's more development that we get uh, as a result. So it's it's just amazing. Really, really is. What about black? I don't know. So actually after that move, knight d6, king c5. And we just ate. Didn't even didn't even count that black was actually going with anything. We just keep on going with those pieces. <laughs> Who cares about the rest? And uh, Reality is that you know the game is basically over already. Um, so keep in mind this: pressure and peace activity are the two things that are going to help you prove that a sacrifice is being correct. And we have a lot more than that, apparently, with those pawns and this knight moving. Check d6, d7. Check c7. The two pawns are going, the knight is close, and the king is ready. Wow, this is the way. It's perfect, it was consistent, and it was working out the way it was supposed to work out. <coughs> um, I really want to say that this game is a great example of seeing how a sacrifice does not just appear out of thin air. It's something that we have to work on until we get, and it's just not easy, you know? It's really not that easy. But once we get it, once we really reach that point, it's it's incredible. It's amazing. And I want to show you one more example that I find is quite beautiful. It's, once again, I do want to suggest that you take a look at Grandmaster Brian Kors's method, his second method course, which is focused on the classic the classical masters and especially talks he teaches a lot about positional principles and sacrifices um you can take a look at the link below the video it's coming with a 50 percent off only for the next couple hours um for the next few hours and and you know uh, it's it's an amazing course at a brilliant price so you check it out now uh, I would like to show you one more game that was actually played between Nakamura himself. I think Nakamura is one of the greatest players who knows the dynamics of a sacrifice. And I think it will be really instructive to really talk this through 
so that I could show you how he was able to evaluate it correctly. So here we go. Nakamura was playing with white. Let's talk about it. The game started off with d4, c4, knight c3, e4, and knight f3. So this was actually quite well done. Black castle, white played bishop e2, and next move, d to d5. It's interesting because everybody, almost everyone knows that the exchange on the e5 is not that good when it comes to uh, black playing it. Because even if white gets to grab the pawn, the knight on e5 will be exposed to black's attack, and, and we just don't want to do this. Anyway, white did it. He exchanged the queens and he jumped out with his knight on the d5, hoping to threaten c7 and maybe even reach out for moves like bishop g5. It was a very, very good move. He takes, takes back, c6, and then bishop c4. Something quite powerful you realize here is that it's not just white's pieces coming forward to advance on black, but it's also every single piece that white is having really coming in close and, and, and reaching out to attack. It's more than just a good idea. It's powerful. Black played b5, but then white simply came right back to b3. And then after bishop b7, there was bishop g5. Rig d7 and rook c1. And now you realize something amazing. What has happened from the very beginning of this game is that White used the temporary initiative, the momentum that he was having, in order to very effectively launch a series of strikes or attacks against Black's position. And as he did that, as he was able to do it, it's like uh, you know he he basically grows not just his position and the formation and the structure, but also the build-up. Knight takes d, pawn takes d, c6, bishop c4, trip b3, attack, rook c1. We got c6 under pressure now. We got the black pieces backsided, and it didn't matter what he was doing. King e2. Again, we're talking about the sacrifice out of a quiet, very quiet position. But it's exactly what Nakamura wanted. He wasn't even actually planning a sacrifice. He can never plan a sacrifice. He just goes. Takes. Takes. Bishop d5. Look at the pressure. And it's all coming for free. Takes. Now, of course, black exchanges the bishop on d5 to avoid the pressure. Takes. Capture. Now black's feeling pretty good. But then you realize he's not. Because, again, white has more powerful pieces going more advanced. Rook b8, king d3, rook d8, and rook c1. See, Nakamura is known as a fantastic attacking player, and yet the base, the core of many of his different, uh, you know, tactics is, re you know, really relies on the ability to stay advanced. Now, the only thing is that Black just played bishop f8, and his intention is clear. He says, give me your rook or the pawn on d5. Whichever, I don't care. If you do, do this, I'm going to equalize and things will be clear. So I want you to think about this position and tell me, what do you believe White must do right now? What's White's best way or move to go by? Should we actually advance with the Rook or should we go back? Should we try to keep up the pressure? Or should we do something else? Now remember this. In the end game, as opposed to middle game and opening, where there are different priorities for each position, in the end game, everything is about activity. Everything. First and highest priority, even more than the material, is how do we get more active? So even though we can have knight takes d and king takes d and rook c7, Nakamura played knight e5. What a move. If black captures the rook, we get rook takes to the c, and now we realize that exchange up doesn't mean anything for black, since 
his rooks are completely useless. We got knight c6 coming. We got king takes d4 coming. We got everything. So black drives rook d6. Does anybody have any suggestion on what white should do next? So remember, you've got great pieces. That's perfect. But what now? How do we use these pieces to apply more tension or threats? <clears throat> King takes d4. I like that idea because we can have that possibility to go ahead and attack. Yes, king takes d, king f8, f4. Black plays king e8, and then, of course, what we're doing in this position is h4. It's the restriction that we do. It's the pressure we keep that holds him back for longer. He moves back, g4. Black plays this move, and there's g5. There's no f6. There's no restriction. And then, of course, black plays with h5. So um, what would you guys do now? Hmm. Anybody? Hmm. Great pieces, great control, great restriction. All the good factors that can help you to keep up an attack. But, but you got to know that it's not enough. So you might knew this. What is very important here is to wait. <laughs> Nobody would guess that. Wait and let the opponent basically suffer and, and feel the pain because he's in a bad position. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, for example, now we can do this type of move. So just after continuing with this, we can continue with a move like Rook to the C7. And um, so, yeah, that's a perfect idea. So after continuing with the King to the E4, Black plays f6, rook to the c6. And um, that's amazing. What we find out in this type of position is that first and foremost, you have to keep the tension against the opponent. And then if you can keep the opponent <clears throat> under severe pressure, you know, he's going to lose. This is what we need to do. Just keep the opponent under a severe pressure, so he more mistakes he's going to have. And uh, uh, that's that's pretty amazing. So let's see. After this move, what is amazing is that Black plays f5 with a check. And, uh, of course, after that type of a move, then, you know, surely there's this rook to the d8. And, of course, after continuing with this move, uh, Black is in a horrible-looking position. He doesn't have anything. Remember that. The biggest idea is to not let him off the hook. It's all about that. Here, rook takes d, rook takes to the d, king c5, <clears throat> king e7, a3, and as black plays like this, you have knight c6. The knight dominates the rook because white has proven that the relative value of both his knight, the pawn, and the king are more important than any of black's current pieces. And that's amazing. That's really amazing. There's no stopping of d7 plus d8. And there we go. So I, I hope that you really like this game. I mean, I loved it. I thought that this was an excellent game, a good example to realize. And... Um, Again, just this, it's it's really instructive to see these these principles working out and how how and why they're so important. So uh, again, guys, don't forget that you could actually check the link below this video for the amazing fifty percent discount of Grandmaster Brian Smith's uh, lecture series. And remember, the key lesson of these games. If you want, I can send them, uh, like send those games to you, so that you could review those. But you know, 
remember uh, that the key idea is keep the good activity, and at a certain point when the position is ready, can break through and open an attack. Sacrifices are only when the position is ready. When you feel it's ready, you can do it. So have a good time, and I'll speak to you next Saturday.